J'invite maintenant le Premier ministre à nous adresser la parole. Monsieur le Premier ministre. The right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chers parlementaires, amis et collègues, bonjour et merci d'être ici aujourd'hui pour accueillir un dirigeant courageux et exceptionnel. Exceptional leader. President Zelensky, on behalf of parliamentarians and on behalf of all Canadians, it is an honour to welcome you to our House. Mr. President, Volodymyr, you are a friend. Canadians and Ukrainians are friends, and they have been for a long time. Our people share deep historical ties. In the early 20th century, a massive wave of Ukrainian immigrants came to Canada. Many of them settled in the Canadian prairies. They worked the land. They built churches distinguished by their beautiful spires, and they helped shape Canada in significant ways. Notre pays compte aujourd'hui 1.4 million de Canadiens. There are 1.4 million Ukrainian Canadians in our country, making it the second largest Ukrainian diaspora in the world, whether as farmers, producers, scientists, community leaders, athletes, or frontline workers. Ukrainian Canadians continue to make a tremendous contribution to our country. But the friendship between Canada and Ukraine is not only based on this shared history, it is also based on our shared values. Volodymyr, in the years I've known you, I've always thought of you as a champion for democracy. And now, democracies around the world are lucky to have you as our champion. Your courage and the courage of your people inspires us all. You're defending the right of Ukrainians to choose their own future. And in doing so, you're defending the values that form the pillars of all free democratic countries. Freedom, human rights, justice, truth, international order. Yeah, These clearly. are the values you're risking your life for as you fight for Ukraine and Ukrainians. Beyond that, you're inspiring democracies and democratic leaders around the world to be more courageous, more united, and to fight harder for what we believe in. You remind us that friends are always stronger together. With allies and partners, we're imposing crippling sanctions to make sure Putin and his enablers in Russia and Belarus are held accountable. Today, in line with our European Union partners, I can announce that we have imposed severe sanctions on 15 new Russian officials, including government and military elites who are complicit in this illegal war. Le Canada va continuer de soutenir Canada will continue to support Ukraine with military equipment as well as financial and humanitarian assistance. And we will be there to help rebuild once the aggressor is repelled. In Canada, we like to root for the underdog. We believe that when a cause is just and right, it will always prevail, no matter the size of the opponent. This doesn't mean it'll be easy. Ukrainians are already paying incalculable human costs. This illegal and unnecessary war is a grave mistake, and Putin must stop it now. Le 
Le mépris flagrant de Vladimir Poutine pour la vie humaine est blatant disregard pour la vie humaine est absolument inacceptable. Le Canada continue à demander que la Russie arrête de targeter les civils et end cette guerre injustifiable. Les Ukrainiens sont en train de l'autoritarianisme. Et comme parlementaires, unis dans cette house aujourd'hui, et tous les Canadiens, nous sommes avec vous. As friends, you can count on our unwavering and steadfast support. And now, it is my great privilege to introduce to you all the President of Ukraine, our friend, Volodymyr Zelensky. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister, dear Justin, members of the government, members of the parliament, all distinguished guests, friends, before I begin, I would like you to understand my feelings and feelings of all Ukrainians as far as it is possible. Our feelings over the last 20 days, 20 days of a full-scale aggression of Russian Federation after eight years of fightings in Donbass region. Can you only imagine? Imagine that on the on 4 a.m. each of you, you start hearing bomb explosions, severe explosion. Justin, can you imagine hearing? You, your children, hear all these severe explosions, bombing of airport, bombing of Ottawa airport, tens of other cities of your wonderful country. Can you imagine that? Cruise, cruise missiles are being falling down on your terrain, and your children are asking you what happened, and you are receiving the first news, which infrastructure objects have been bombed and destroyed by Russian Federation. And you know how many people already died. Can you only imagine what words, how can you explain to your children that you just, uh, full-scale aggression just happened in your country? You know that this is war to annihilate your state, your country. You know that this is the war to subjugate your people. And on second day, you receive uh, notifications that huge columns of military equipment are entering your country, crossing the border. They're entering small cities. They are giving siege. They're encircling cities. And and they start to shell civil neighborhoods. They bomb school buildings. They destroyed kindergarten facilities. Like in our city, city of Sumy, like in city of Ohtyrka. Imagine that someone is taking siege, laying siege to Vancouver. Can you just imagine them for a second? and all these people who are left in such city. And this is exactly the situation that our city of Mariupol is suffering right now. And they are left without heat or hydro, or without means of communicating, almost without food, without water, seeking shelter in bomb shelters. Dear Justin, dear guests, can you imagine that every day you receive memorandums about the number of casualties, including among women and children. You've heard about the bombings. Currently, we have 97 children that died during this war. Can you imagine famous CN Tower in Toronto? 
if, they, if it was hit by Russian bombs. Of course, I don't wish this on anyone, but this is our reality in which we live. We have to contemplate, we have to see where the next bombing will take place. Uh, your church is square. We have a freedom square in the city of, of in the city of Harden. Our Babin Yar, the place where uh, uh, victims of Holocaust were buried, and they, they, it has been bombed by the Russians. Imagine that Canadian facilities have been bombed, similarly as our buildings and memorial places are being bombed. A number of families have died. Every night is a horrible night. Russians are shelling from all kinds of artillery, from tanks. They are hitting civilian infrastructure. They are hitting uh, big buildings. Uh, can you imagine that there is a uh, fire starting at a nuclear power plant, and that's exactly what happened in our country. Each city that they are marching through, they are taking down Ukrainian flags. Can you imagine someone taking down your Canadian flags in Montreal and other Canadian cities? I know that you all support Ukraine. We've been friends with you, Justin, but also I would like you to understand and I would like you to feel this, what we feel every day. We want to live, and we want to be victorious. We want to prevail for the sake of life. Can you imagine when you, when you call your friends, your friendly nation, and you ask, please close the sky, close the airspace, Please stop the bombing. How many more cruise missiles have to fall on our cities until you make this happen? And they, in return, they express their deep concerns about the situation. When we talk to with our partners and they say, please hold on, hold on a little longer. Some some people are talking about uh, trying to avoid the escalation. And at the same time, in response to our aspiration to become members of NATO, we also do not hear a clear answer. Sometimes we don't see obvious things. It's a, it's a dire straits, but it also allowed us to see who our real friends are over the last 20 days, and as well eight previous years. I am sure that you've been able to see clearly what's going on, and I'm addressing all of you. Canada has always been steadfast in their support. It's, you've been a reliable partner to Ukraine and Ukrainians, and I'm sure this will continue. You've offered your help, your assistance, at the, our earliest request, you supply us with the military assistance, with humanitarian assistance, you impose severe sanctions, serious sanctions. At the same time, we see that, unfortunately, this, this they did not bring the end to the war. You, you can see that our cities like Kharkiv, Mariupol, and many other cities are not protected just like your cities are protected, Edmonton, Vancouver. You can see that Kyiv is being shelled and bombed, Ivano-Frank city, ivano Frankivsk. It used to be, we were a very peaceful country, peaceful cities, but now they're being constantly bombarded. bombarded. Basically, what I'm trying to say that we all need to do, you all need to do more to stop Russia, to protect Ukraine, and by doing that, to protect Europe from Russian threat. They're destroying everything, memorial complexes, schools, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, housing complex.
they already killed 97 Ukrainian children. We are not asking for much. We are asking for justice, for real support, which will help us to prevail, to defend, to save life, to save life all of the world. Canada is leading in these efforts, and I am hoping that other countries will follow the same suit. We are asking for more of your leadership, and please take more, uh, greater part in these efforts, Justin and all of our friends of our of Ukraine, all friends of the truth, please understand how important it is for us to close our airspace from Russian missiles and Russian aircrafts. I hope you can understand. I hope you can increase your efforts. You can increase sanctions so they don't so they will not have a single dollar to fund their war effort. Uh, commercial entities should not be working in Russia. Probably you know better than many in any other countries that this attack on Ukraine, it's an, their attempt to annihilate Ukrainian people, and there is nothing else to it. This is their main objective. It's actually the war against Ukrainian people. And it's an attempt to destroy everything that we as Ukrainians do. It's an attempt to destroy our future, to destroy our nation, our character. You Canadians, you know very well all this. That's why I'm asking you, please do not stop in your efforts. Please expand your efforts to bring back peace in our peaceful country. I believe, and I know that you can do it, and we are building, we are part of the anti-war coalition and jointly I'm sure that we'll achieve results. I would like to also ask our Ukrainian diaspora in Canada. This is a historical moment and we need your support, your practical support. And we hope that with your practical steps you will show that you are part of the modern Ukrainian history. Please remember, this is a, a practical modern day history of Ukraine. We want to live, we want to have peace. I am grateful to everyone of you in the Parliament of Canada who is present there, to every Canadian citizen. I am very grateful to you, Justin. I am grateful to Canadian people, and I am confident that together we will overcome and we will be victorious. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you to Canada.
Thank you, Mr. President. I now invite the Honorable George Fury, Speaker of the Senate, to say a few words. Okay, an extraordinary 12-minute speech Remarkable. from President Zelensky from the battlefield there, Marcia. A long-standing ovation yeah. uh, in the end chants of Slava Ukraine, glory to Ukraine, which we've heard before. A remarkable speech, and we'll come back when the leaders are speaking. The head, uh, George Fury, Senator Fury, is going to speak. We will go back when the, the uh, elected leaders speak. But... It was a speech that was personal. Yes. It was powerful. Two Canadians. It was purposeful yeah. and it was persuasive. It was personal saying, just imagine addressing the prime minister as Justin. Justin Trudeau called him a friend saying, just imagine your children hearing the explosions. And it was imagine, imagine if this was happening to you. It was personal. It was very powerful. He's a masterful communicator, but it was purposeful. The steel edge there. We need more help. We need a no fly zone. We need the skies protected. We need you to do more. We need to know who our real friends are. We need to stop what he called the battle to annihilate and extinguish Ukraine. And the question is, though it was remarkably persuasive, as you saw him in his military fatigues, as he has that green color, um, the remarkable President Zelensky, persuasive, but persuasive enough for NATO to cross that red line. At this moment, no, Marcia. Yeah, and speaking directly to Canadians, invoking a number of Canadian cities and images. Imagine seeing Vancouver under siege. Imagine if the CN Tower was being hit with bombs or flags were being burned in Montreal. Um, but again, as you point out, he said the sanctions are not enough. And he asked what we expected him to ask for airspace to be closed over over Ukraine to protect people because they don't know how to explain to their children why bombs are going off at 4 a.m. So if we can bring back our panel and on that last point, once again, bring in CTV's military analyst, retired Major General David Frazier. How do you say no? Does NATO budge? I mean, when you hear him making that compelling case, they want the airspace closed. How does NATO not flinch? Well, he is one of the most remarkable speakers I've seen in a very long time. He personalized it. He actually gave us a scene on the ground through the eyes of the Ukrainian citizens of what's going on in a way that I have not heard leaders talk before. He is masterful at this, and he made it such a compelling argument to the parliament, to the Ukrainian Canadians, and to all Canadians. Unfortunately, I think that we are still at the same spot where as much as he wants the uh, uh, skies closed, we are not going to close those uh, skies right now because this is about all of Europe and uh, leaders are not prepared to sacrifice Europe for Ukraine just yet. And now uh, let, me, let me move on. Joyce, uh, Joyce your, your reaction to this uh, remarkable speech. And again, I want to remind folks, uh, when we hear from the Conservatives, uh, the NDP and the Bloc and the Greens, we will give you those speeches live. Uh, Joyce, again, it was very personal, but it was very purposeful as well. Uh, he wants action now. Yes, it was very masterful, but we know this man is a master communicator, so not surprising. A very touching speech, though, because uh, he spoke to Justin, uh, calling him by his first name. Imagine your children asking you at 4 a.m., why is this going on? What is happening? Referring to the CN Tower, to Vancouver, um, you know, comparing it to what's happened to Mariupol. So, you know, obviously a very, a very clever speech, but again, uh, asking for the closing of the airspace above his country, something that the Americans have already said no. Look, the Americans don't even want those jets to be sent to Ukraine, fearing that that may be the red line. Uh, you know, what is, where is the line between all the lethal, um, lethal aid that the West is sending to, uh, to Ukraine and the West actually being involved in Ukraine? At which point is all that sending of lethal weapons 
become the, that NATO is involved in this, in this fight. I'd be very curious to hear what uh, the elected uh, opposition has to say about this, because when we asked the prime minister, I asked the prime minister, would you be willing to go to war if one NATO country uh, was invaded by just one centimeter? The prime minister invoked Article 5, meaning an attack on one is an attack on all. Um, I viewed that as a yes answer. So um, the countries, the NATO countries are saying until it is not a NATO country, we will not get involved. We'll send as many weapons as we can, but that's not real involvement. I mean, I would like to ask the general, at which point is sending all those lethal weapons really involvement? Well, quite frankly, I mean, we are involved, but we are involved in a way that is acceptable to Putin, such that he is not going to fire his nuclear weapons or uh, expand the fight into NATO And as as distasteful as that sounds and as as hard as that is, uh, that's the reality on the ground. And as you said, Joyce, those airplanes seem to be the line that Putin says is that now becomes NATO involvement and that expands this war outside of Ukraine. And that's what nobody wants, including our prime minister. So um, that's where we are. I want, I want to bring in Mike Le Couture. Mike, um, we're talking a lot about the policy and the politics. Um, mm-hmm. This was personal. Uh, President Zelensky's a young father. Uh, President Zelensky appealed to his, quote, friend Justin as a young father. Mm-hmm. Imagine your kids. He was uh, building pictures so every Canadian watching feels this personally and so he wants to make the political personal why because and you saw the targets today uh, russia is bombing apartment buildings they are bombing civilians and i think part of his message was this is a decision not just of policy but of the heart of personal and that was part of his strategy today uh hold on and, uh, and mike, you uh, we're gonna we're mike, yeah. mike just hang on i think candace okay. bergen is gonna speak now let let We'll come back. By Here's first leader, and foremost, stating on behalf of my Conservative caucus, our complete admiration and respect for the people and the nation of Ukraine. And to President Zelensky, let me express to you how much I admire your courage and your sacrificial leadership at this critical time in Ukraine's history. The kind of leadership that you are showing, sir, is very rare, and it serves as an inspiration to all of us who are elected. You are the leader of Ukraine for such a time as this, and we remain indebted to you. Monsieur le Président Zelensky, merci pour votre leadership dans cette camp contre votre pays et votre défense de la démocratie. The official opposition stands with Ukraine. It is our duty. We will also be there after this conflict in order to help you rebuild Ukraine. Your courage inspires us. The images that we are seeing from Ukraine, as you described them, President, are heartbreaking and painful. Families huddled in bomb shelters, the ruins of a children's hospital and a maternity ward, the elderly elderly who are trying to find their way to safety. But there is also inspiration as we watch ordinary people, men and women of all ages, defending their homeland. We are witnesses to the strength and the defiance of Ukrainians standing up for their freedom, their independence and their sovereignty. Ukrainians aren't just fighting to defend themselves. Let's be very clear. They are defending all of Europe because Putin's brutal attack on Ukraine is an attack on all of us. That's the lesson history has taught us and one we cannot ignore. And and it is why we must help the people of Ukraine in every way possible. Canada has the largest number of people of Ukraine descent outside of Ukraine and Russia. For a century, they have enriched our communities and our culture, our our culture, especially in the Canadian prairies, which is where I am from. Canada, and Manitoba in particular, share ties with Ukraine that cannot be broken. 
And now almost 1.4 million Ukrainian Canadians are watching what is happening. Their hearts and their souls are reaching out, hoping, praying for the nation and the people of their forebears. This war of naked aggression has revealed Vladimir Putin for what he really is, a warmonger and a violent predator with no regard for human life and suffering. He has crossed lines that after two world wars we thought would never be crossed, and he's shaken the rule-based order that has kept millions safe since 1945. Every day he tells the world lies, and then he proceeds to kill innocent and vulnerable Ukrainians, including women and children. And while on his rampage, he continues to threaten the world, saying if he doesn't get his way, he will use the worst extremes possible. It's sickening to watch. Putin must be brought to justice. He must be held to account for his crimes against humanity at the International Criminal Court at The Hague. just a war against Ukraine, it is a war against the free democratic world. We must stand with Ukraine. It is not a choice, it is a moral duty. Canada was the first country to recognize Ukraine's independence from the Soviet Union. Now it's time to honour that legacy. We must do more together with our allies to secure Ukraine's airspace. We need to protect protect at a minimum the airspace over the humanitarian corridors so that Ukrainians can seek safe passage away from the war zones and to allow humanitarian relief to reach those areas under siege. Canada must do whatever it can to cut through any red tape and welcome Ukrainians who are fleeing, although we all know that what Ukrainians want most is to be able to live in their home nation free, sovereign and peaceful. President Zelensky. reassure you that Canada will be a safe haven for Ukraine citizens who choose to come here until the battle is over. While they are in Canada, we will cherish them, care for them, provide for them purpose and hope, and when it is time, they will return to their beloved Ukraine and their families. This is our pledge to you. Let me conclude by saying simply, Canadians support you today as you face Putin and his reckless empire building. Conservatives stand shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine and we will continue to support you when this terrible conflict finally ends and you rebuild your homes and communities. Your courage and faith and your fortitude in the face of adversity are an inspiration to all of us. Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. Keep fighting, keep believing, keep hoping. Thank you. Okay, Candace Bergen just finishing. We now will hear, I get from the, the block and then the NDP and then the Greens. Uh, while we're waiting, Mike, just pick up again. There's some interesting things there about protecting the humanitarian corridors that Candace Bergen said. Anything strike you in that speech, Mike LeCouture, and, and President Zelensky's speech? Yeah, I think Candace Bergen's speech, just the willingness in saying that the Conservatives will be there to help Ukrainians as much as possible, possibly paving the way for some political capital that the Liberal government may need and the cooperation that they may need in trying to sort of push through and new immigration measures, new sanctions that they may need collaboration on. Because don't forget, some of these sanctions that Canada is imposing on uh, Russian officials and Russian companies do have a blowback. Just the fact that there is a blockage of any kind of fertilizers that are coming and, and those types of things from Belarus and Russia, that 
causes significant pain on Canadian companies, on Canadian farmers, and they will need that type of political capital with opposition parties to make sure that some of those things go through. So I think Bergen potentially extending the olive branch across the aisle to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and saying to him, you can go further and we will have uh, you know, your backs and make sure that we have your support. But back to uh, Zelensky's speech, I think one of the things that really struck me, and I think everybody on the panel was talking about it, really personalizing this speech and saying to Canadian parliamentarians, what if this was happening in your riding and in your city? Think of what you would try and do. And the one quote that really struck me was, how many more cruise missiles have to fall in our cities before you close our skies? Again, asking again and again, please enforce the no-fly zone. That is what we need most desperately. And it definitely will affect every parliamentarian that was sitting in that room and that will be walking out of that room and potentially really spur them on as the House of Commons comes back next week to look at different and more creative ways that Canada can help and that Canada can push and continue to tighten around Vladimir Putin and his regime. Right, and I think, Mike, you raise a good point. Um, it was just a month ago, and we can't lose sight of the fact people in Ukraine were living lives very much like we are living our lives right now with freedoms that we're often taking for granted. Joyce, I want to ask you what Candace Bergen was saying there. Maybe you can clarify. Was she asking or, or suggesting that the Conservatives support the idea of a no-fly zone or just a safe space for people to be able to evacuate and for those refugees to be able to flee the country? Uh, that's a really good question. I thought exactly the same thing. Pretty good speech. I mean, she used some pretty strong words. I liked the warmonger and violent predator. Um, you know, that, that is, you know, strong words spoken by the opposition. But when she says we must do more to secure Ukrainian airspace, sounds very much like closing the airspace over Ukraine, if not just to secure that humanitarian corridor. So, you know, usually you ask for a temporary ceasefire or you agree on a humanitarian corridor. Um, but I do believe, and I, I think the question should be posed to her, are you actually in favor of Canada, you know, pushing mm -hmm. for a no-fly zone? That seems to be what, what she was saying with all that that implies. Major General, what yeah, did can you I, hear? I'll just read it. Uh, Marcia, let me just read yeah. it. I just want to read that because I think this, is, this could be a, a very major difference here. We must do more together with our allies to secure Ukraine's airspace. We need to protect, at minimum, the airspace over humanitarian corridors so the Ukrainians can seek safe passage away from war zones and to allow humanitarian relief to reach those under siege. Marcia, uh, that is a major policy difference, not only between the Liberals and the Conservatives, but the Conservatives and NATO, uh, even if it's securing airspace for humanitarian corridors, uh, that, is a, that, is, that is essentially sending NATO planes in the air. Marcia, back to you, but that's a significant new development. Well, Major General, what did you hear? Well, Marcia, team, uh, I actually heard her asking to close the airspace. And, um, and I think we have to balance the emotions from the hard, cold realities of making decisions that affect the world. And let's not forget one person, Putin. We've got to start thinking, what is Putin thinking and what is Putin going to do? Putin has promised and threatened, and he's always made true of his threats. And that airspace corridor and whatnot, you can't separate the humanitarian corridor from combat on the ground, it is going to lead to something much bigger. And I, you know, emotionally, and the decision of what we do with the airspace, uh, we are still not anywhere different than we were yesterday with the Western leaders talking about uh, Ukrainian airspace. It is still a problem for all of us. Uh, and I guess... And Marcia, Marcia yeah, if, I, if I just may yeah. pick up on that, I mean, easy for Candace Bergen as the interim leader of the opposition to say, close the airspace. She's not the one that has to talk to NATO, I think, picking up on uh, General Fraser's comments here. She's not the one that has to go to the NATO table and say, hey, how about this idea? I think we should do this, and then throw uh, NATO into a much different position. So I think for an opposition leader, an interim opposition leader, to say, let's close the airspace, that may be a bit of an easier thing for her to say than potentially Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And 
and I was going to say to Major General, you know, we're always wondering day to day what Putin's going to do, but we he knows what what Ukraine and the West and, and NATO are doing. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we are having an effect on, on Putin. And, you know, I think the one thing I've heard is, you know, the economic sanctions are hurting them. And we've got to start thinking like Russians on Save that using thought. Save that thought, please, if you don't mind. We're going to go back. Uh, the NDP leader is now speaking in the House. Let's listen. Merci, Monsieur Blanchet. Thank you, Mr. I Blanchet. now invite the leader of the New Democratic Party, Mr. Jagmeet Singh, to speak to us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank President Zelensky. We heard his words today. We want to thank him for his courage, his inspiration, his resilience. We want to thank the people of Ukraine for their courage and their resilience. He asked us to imagine what it's like to wake up four in the morning to bombing. He asked us to imagine what it's like to explain to, his, to children. What does it mean? What is going on? Why are we being bombed? Why are we being attacked? He asked us to imagine what it would be like to lose 97 children to a war. He asked us to imagine if major cities in our country, major cities and major places that we think about, think about Montreal and Ottawa, our capital city, Toronto, Vancouver. He asked us to imagine what it would be like if tanks rolled into these cities. What would it be like to see bombs fall on our homes and our cities and our communities, on schools, on hospitals? He asked us to imagine that, and frankly, we can't imagine that. Sitting in Canada, it is unimaginable. But we've seen the horrors unfolding in Ukraine. We've heard the words of President Zelensky. We've spoken with Ukrainian Canadians who share with us the pain that they're experiencing right now, not knowing if their loved ones are gonna survive the night. We've heard from families that call constantly asking, are you okay? Are you still alive? It is unimaginable for us. And he asked us, imagine what it's like and please help. He asked for more help. He acknowledged that so far Canada has been a strong ally, but he asked for more help. And we must answer that call. Canadians stand with Ukraine and will answer that call to provide as much help as possible in this time. Canadians want to do more. And we heard from President Zelensky that sanctions are important and we want to increase that. We know that one of the most important things we can do, we know that Putin does not care. President Putin does not care about the people. He does not care about his country, but he does care about his wealth. And we know the way to attack Putin, the way to make sure that he feels the pressure of the sanctions is to target him where it, co where it counts, and that is to target the wealth that is held by his allies and oligarchs. And so we are on that path, and we need to continue to apply the most severe of sanctions possible to target specifically President Putin and his wealth. And we know that we can provide humanitarian help. Canada has done its part and needs to continue to do that. We need to welcome Ukrainians that are fleeing this crisis, that are seeking refuge. We need to provide humanitarian help on the ground. We need to continue to provide that support. President Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky has asked us if we can imagine the horrors of this war, of this war rather. He's asked us if we can imagine if the same war were to happen here in Canada. And this is something that is unfathomable to us. He asked that we increase assistance and we must do so to Ukraine. We must increase sanctions and we must meet the needs of Ukrainians. And we will do so. I think about the words that we've heard from President Zelensky, the speeches that he's given, and I think about the moments of courage that we've seen reported from everyday Ukrainians standing up to this violence, standing up to this flagrant aggression of, of President Putin, something that we clearly and firmly denounce. When we see in those moments, we see incredible courage. I, I struggle to find the words to describe it. And I think about something my mom always taught me, this phrase in Punjabi, it's chardikala, 
And I always misunderstood what it meant. She says it means rising spirits. And she always said it's rising spirits in the face of difficult odds. And I can't think a moment to describe the courage of Ukrainians, the courage of President Zelensky. I can't think of a, a more fitting moment to describe that as Tartikala, as rising spirits, as a defiant optimism in the face of one of the largest armies in the world. Ukrainians are saying, we will not back down. We will not give up. And we are so incredibly inspired by them for their fight for democracy, for their fight for freedom. And we stand in full solidarity. We wish their Tartikala, their rising spirits, their defiant optimism to continue. And we will be with you every step of the way. Thank you. Okay, Jagmeet Singh saying that he is inspired by Zelensky and his comments punctuated by a baby. <laughs> that was there. We all heard that baby in the background. Uh, I want to pick up where we just left off uh, with Major General David Fraser. Your thought again as Zelensky's address, historic, yes, also making news around the world, CNN, BBC, everyone carrying his comments to Canadian Parliament as he once again asked Canada for more support in this battle against Russia. Please pick up where you left off. Well, I just think that we need to balance the emotion from the actual realities of the facts and, and start considering Putin himself, who is the decision maker. And I think Canadians are going to have to act on, on Canadian, more like hockey players, and we're going to have to take the hockey stick and go after Putin and the rest of the economy. Uh, if we want to help out Zelensky, we just got to hammer these guys with economic sanctions, make sure that China's not part of it, and not work on escalatory. we got to go all in now and hit them where the Russians understand, and that is brute force, annihilation. If they want to annihilate uh, their economy, we'll help them do it. Uh, Russia is retaliating today. We heard the sanctions announced against 15 Russians that were connected to Putin. Russia has just announced that they are banning the prime minister from entering the country and imposing sanctions on 313 Canadian citizens. Evan, that just uh, crossing the wires. Yeah, that is uh, Russia hitting back. Uh, Canadian parliamentarians, like Christian Freeland, who's long been banned, uh, conserv some conservatives like, have also been banned. They wear that as a badge of honor. They don't mind it. Uh, being banned by Russia at this point is something that none of them mind. Uh, in fact, it uh, is something that um, they regard as another sign that Vladimir Putin is isolated and, to use the words, uh, suffocating. There is another piece of news that's interesting that's just crossing that in the last hour, just before President Zelensky spoke to Canada's parliament, he spoke to a media outlet uh, that's been widely reported called Nexta, where he says, we realize that Ukraine will not become a member of NATO. We understand this. We are an adequate people. We need new formats of interaction with the West and separate security guarantees. Now, I tell you why that's important, because even as in this speech, he urged NATO to close the skies, to escalate uh, toward that level, which is obviously the red line for NATO. He's also saying, we don't want to become a part of NATO. Russia has made that a key demand. We do not want Ukraine to be part of NATO. So, uh, you know, this is the um, fog of war where Russia is both escalating attacks but also negotiating. And here President Zelensky is saying we need air support against Russia, but clearly sending a signal if these reports are accurate and there will be lots of checking that we don't want to become, we will not become part of NATO. Again. These are these micro moments trying to find a way what the uh, the the old war theorist Sun Tzu would say. You have to give your opponents a golden bridge to exit on some way out. Don't surround them. And these are these bridges to de-escalate. And maybe that's one moment that uh, President Zelensky is saying to Russia, we will not be part of NATO. So that's a concession to to Russia. And, and, and again, we just have to read these signs for what they are. Now, whether they lead to anything, we don't know, uh, General Fraser, but just your interpretation, if that is an accurate report that's now being widely reported. 
Well, Evan, I think that's actually a strategic message that actually that will uh, appease Putin. This is all about face. If we can create the conditions where Putin can save some face and protect uh, Ukraine, maybe not being part of NATO is important, but they could be uh, part of the EU so they can have an economic uh, tie to the West and yet create space between NATO and Russia. This is huge. And this is exactly what those uh, political dis dialogues need to figure out is a compromise that will protect Ukrainians, give uh, Putin a way out and save us from World War III. Very important uh, comments what you just gave us. Okay, well, as our special coverage is about to come to an end in a few minutes, let's uh, just go around one more time, get a thought on what we heard today and where we go from here. Starting with you, Joyce. Well, that's interesting. I mean, the fact that he admits that, no, we don't need to be a part of NATO, uh, will that be enough for the Russians? I mean, we have seen the Russians at the negotiating table. Uh, we've heard the foreign affairs minister, who's like the Darth Vader of dip diplomats, saying, uh, no, we, uh, we are still fighting Nazis in, uh, in Ukraine and all those drug addicts. So this, are they believing what they're saying to the world? Or do they know that we know that they're lying, but they keep lying? So, you know, the, the fact that he's making this concession today is a good step, if indeed, as, as Evan says, it is true. But will it even be closely to enough for the Russians? That's the question. Mike? Yeah, I think I agree with Joyce and uh, Major General Fraser in terms of is this the way out? Is this that golden bridge? Uh, but more specifically here in Canada, where does Parliament go from here? I think just sitting in this room, even though there's a you know thick wall between me and the House of Commons and the actual chamber, you could feel the emotion through. You could feel the ovations and the standing ovation after Zelensky spoke. And whether or not that spurs Canadian lawmakers and parliamentarians to do more and to push further and does Canada now potentially step forward to try and be part of this process of de-escalation and continued de-escalation to try and make sure that there is a way out for Putin. And we haven't really been at the table specifically so far, but is there a way for Canada to play a role here? Although Canada, as we're hearing from Christian Freeland, the Deputy Prime Minister, is someone who is there at the table with the NATO allies and Western allies to look at different creative ways to have these sanctions and to make sure that everybody is coordinated. So where does Canada go from here if this glimmer of hope is what it looks like? Is there a role for Canada to play? I think that's, that's something I'll be looking forward, uh, forward to and looking for going forward. And Major General, tomorrow uh, President Zelensky will be addressing the U.S. Congress. Do we expect to hear him hit the same notes? Marcia, I do think we're going to hear the same speech. It'll be a very emotional, emphatic uh, speech that we heard today. I think with the information that Evan has just provided, this is only the first piece of a very long negotiations that is going to be contradictory to the fighting and the killing that's on the ground. But this is actually maybe the first step in a long series of negotiations for maybe a ceasefire. So I think we're going to hear an awful lot more of that tomorrow in the speech and what the U.S. reaction to what Evan has, has announced today. Joyce, Mike, Major General, thank you so much. So Evan, uh, what's coming up on your show later today? Well, I think what we've just seen is pretty remarkable today. Yep. Uh, President Zelensky's 12-minute address, you know, as I said, was very personal, it was powerful, it was purposeful, uh, and it was very persuasive. Uh, and we'll hear more of that. He's a remarkable, historic person in that battlefield address. But let's just pause for a minute and, and remember what he's already done. Whether this leads to negotiations or a no-fly zone, there's speculation on that as the war continues. But what has he already done in 20 days? What has the Ukrainian people already done? They have fought back in a way that nobody imagined. They have made Russia a global pariah. They have unified NATO in a way that 40 years have not done. The last president of the United States declared that NATO was obsolete. NATO is more relevant than ever. They have reawakened this dimming sense that 
democracy's time in the West is passing or dimming. The wattage is full on. You have countries around the world, from Germany to Sweden and now Canada, that will meet their NATO requirements or promise to have 2% GDP. There is a reawakening unity in Western democracies about the value of democracy, and that is owed to the Ukrainian people, and that is owed to President Zelensky standing up to this ruthless attack, and we saw why, because of his remarkable humanity and courage and we'll cover that, the consequences of that speech, the consequences of the war. But make no mistake, President Zelensky has done more to reawaken the cost of democracy and what people must do to defend it, not just in Ukraine, but around the world, everywhere. And those yeah. standing ovations were a testament to his cry that democracy is fragile, can be extinguished by a brutal dictator in a minute, except for the courage of people of leaders and of other democracies that stand up. How far they go, that's a question for military strategists and politicians to avoid escalation. But what a remarkable historical day with that battlefield address won. We shall never forget. Yeah, and that thunderous applause. Evan, thank you so much. And of course, we'll be watching you later today on five at Power Play, excuse me, at five o'clock Eastern Time. And again, the message today from President Vladimir Zelensky to Canada and the West was simple. We want to live. We want to have peace. He has pleaded with Canada and its partners to do more to stop Russia to protect Ukraine. We will see in the days ahead how Canada and the world respond. Those words from the Ukrainian president. I'm Marcia McMillan. That's it for me. CTV's Jennifer Burke is coming up next with the day's top story.